My name is Mark Hahn. Um, I'm a uh, security solutions architect with Qualys. Uh, if you want to follow along with the slides, you can take a look at that uh, URL there in blue at the bottom. You can pull that up on your phone if you want to keep the slides up while we're um, looking at that. It's got speaker notes if you um, press sort of at the bottom of the MRAP presentation, you'll see speaker notes. Um, and this is? Hi, I'm Ted Hahn. I'm his son. We are a father-son team. Um, and we like to do these presentations together, having some fun with it. Um, I'm a site reliability engineer, a consulting site SRE. Uh, I help a number of small startups do cloud native right, uh, security, AWS, um, all of the you know, stuff around Kubernetes clusters, um, whether that be you know, the basic setup to running large distributed apps on them. Cool. So uh, this is our presentation on uh, Kube TLS. It's a tool that helps you um, achieve mutual TLS by injecting um, certificates into every pod. Um, in 2002, we built an, uh, the original version of this. It's a web admissions webhook pod, mm -hmm. um, which mutates the pod. Um, and uh, we've updated it to take advantage of new changes that are coming in, uh, in newer versions of Kubernetes. So uh, in particular, there's a feature called um, uh, cluster trust bundles that allows you to set the, the scope of trust for, for a cluster. So um, let's start off with what is a trust bundle? Um, uh, you know, I imagine some of you have been to the various spiffy talks. Um, so you probably have some idea, but at the same time, I don't think any of them defined trust bundle particularly well. Um, a trust bundle is, at its most simple, a trust bundle is a bunch of CAs. Um, you probably already use a trust bundle that is you know, your browser's web CA store. Um, that's a trust bundle. Uh, but that is a very broadly scoped trust bundle. Um, we want much smaller scoped trust bundles. Um, typically, we want trust bundles per organization, um, or even two or three for your organization. Um, so this yeah. is, yeah. So this is what, uh, essentially, you know, you, you're familiar with this. This is how web certificates work. This is how um, HTTPS TLS certificates work. Um, so at the bottom there, there is a workload certificate. That workload is probably a web server. Um, and that web server is signed by some intermediate cert that then in, in that certificate that you get back from your, your signing authority typically contains both your workload cert and then the intermediate certs that chain up to a, to a CA. And then at the top level, there is that root certificate. On most systems that you're running, your phones, your, your laptops, um, your Linux servers that are deployed in your, in your cloud architecture and on your clusters, that root CA contains about 160 different CAs, um, some of which, you know, some of which are just, are, well, next slide, oh yeah. no. Um, so some of which you know and some of which are, you know, the Peruvian central authority. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so what, what do trust bundles allow you to do? Um, so trust bundles, you know, allow you to verify that somebody is saying something, right? Um, web certificates contain, contain claims, typically SANS, um, and web certificates, you know, verify that the trust bundle has said these things. Um, so what trust bundles will allow you to do is to make the, make well, they'll make your Docker images smaller and they'll allow you to much more rapidly update uh, trust bundles such as the web root of trust. Currently you build the web root of trust into the very base most layer of your Docker image. Um, so you've got all of those things and they're actually you know, sometimes even the majority of a Docker image, uh, the Google distro list image has just four things in it, um, of which the trust bundle is the, the largest by far. Um, that's not true for most Docker images, but you know, that is, that is one of the base most layers. Um, but sometimes that trust bundle changes, right? Um, just a few months ago, trust core was removed from every web CA, um, you know, is, is in the process of being removed. I, I think they have like two or three more days before they're disallowed. Um, but that is still embedded, right? That certificate is still embedded to all of the Docker images you built last week. Um, 
cluster trust bundles can be mounted like config maps, and you will mount them like config maps on at CSSL to update the web root of trust dynamically so you can keep, up, keep that up to date regardless of when your Docker image was built. Um, but more importantly, trust bundles can be mounted like, uh, like config maps, and you can have a bunch of different trust bundles for all of the different little scopes that you need. And so that's what we're looking for is to try and limit the scope of trust. So um, as we said, you know, your, that top row of CAs, of, of, of root CAs, is essentially the, the web root of trust and the trust that's in most Linux distributions, um, Amazon Linux, Google DistroList, Alpine, you name it, it's got 160 of those. What we recommend and what, what our opinion is, you know, on your clusters, you basically want a very limited set of top-level CAs. You want essentially your internal private certificate authority to be your root of trust and no others. Maybe, maybe a partner or two, but not on every server that you've got. So what, we, what, what we're looking to do is try and implement, a, uh, provide a way to implement easily um, trust bundles that limit your scope to just the part in blue and not the 150 items in red, right? There's no reason that any server should have to trust, um, you know, a, a Peruvian cafe website. But your, your system would accept that Peruvian cafe website's TLS certificate because it's got an intermediate chain that roots up to um, the, the Peruvian root authority, which is in your trust bundle. And, and part of this point is not that you shouldn't trust those, all of those web certs, but you should trust them for when you're going to the web. For most applications, for most of your internal calls, you are not going to the web. You should be using a trust bundle that is scoped to your internal network. Um, so the, the web root of trust will still be around. It just won't be the default for most of your applications. Right. So in our keynote this morning, we just added this slide, yeah. um, the, the presenter, Zach, um, Zach Butcher. Butcher. Yeah. Zach Butcher mentioned, you know, trying to get to a zero trust architecture. These were the five points that he made. Kube TLS helped to implement those first three points very easily. Yeah. So we'll show you how this works. Yeah. So Kube TLS automatically injects certificates that provide workload identity onto every pod and every container in the cluster. Um, they provide uh, privacy by TLS encryption. They provide authentication by TLS uh, mutual encryption. And authorization comes very quickly from that, um, simply because you're, you know, once you have those identities, those per pod, per service account identities, authorization becomes a, a, a very quick layer. Um, so yeah. how, do you do, how do you do secure networking on Kubernetes? Well, you know, in the last talk, there was a number of, of they, they went over a bunch of those ways. Um, any number of talks here are gonna talk about um, different ways to do that. So, uh, the two most common ways are these first two sub bullets is one is you're using sidecars and um, we're not a big fan of sidecars they don't they don't cover all the space um, they're complicated they're typically managed in enterprises by teams that are not your application development teams so they're orthogonal to your application architecture uh, the other thing is that your your, secure, your application security architecture should be designed in your application. And one of, the, one of the 12 factors in the 12 factor app is that there's a sort of a single point, you're, you minimize dependencies. And so if your security of your application architecture is depending on not only your application but also these sidecars, now you've got yeah. two points that are, that are doing that, not a single, single dependency for it. Um, the other choice is um, some kind of CNI, complex CNI thing with, with um, Calico or something where you're trying to limit network access and who can, who can send packets to who. And again, this is at the wrong layer. It is in your network architecture, your, your application security architecture is now dependent on your network architecture and, and the two have to change in sync and that can be very difficult. So neither of these two ways are very, um, they, they're, Difficult to manage. Typically, in most organizations, you have two separate groups that do it, and so there's a lot of communication that's got to happen. Our recommendation is the right way to do this is that every service speaks TLS natively. So it doesn't send a packet anywhere unless it's over a TLS link. And to do that, you need certificates in every pod so that you can 
create that TLS connection. In, in, our, demo, um, in our demo repository, which is linked at the end of this presentation, we show different examples of how you configure your service so that it speaks TLS natively, how to get, how to get that private key and that certificate bundled into however your particular language does yeah. um, web service. And it really is usually that simple as, you know, when, when you are making a gRPC connection, you have to specify, I am doing this the insecure way, or you can specify, I am doing this the kube TLS way. Yeah. We provide just a gRPC dial option that makes it, you know, just picks up the right place, picks up the right certificates for your cluster. We provide a Java version of this as well. That, yeah. um, and if you've ever gone, you know, Google how to do MTLS with Java, like half of it is how to create this, not half of it, 90% of it is how to create the certificate, and 10% and of it is like, here's the Java code that just simply uses yeah. that, that certificate and private key. Yeah. Um, and we've simplified that 90% down to 5%. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, one of these days I'll get around to writing the Python version. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, so um, the nice thing about TLS everywhere at the application level is that there is no chance of it being sniffed whenever it is leaving your pod and in fact your application's uh, you know, memory space, it is TLS encrypted. It's TLS native, it's encrypted, and it's mutually authenticated everywhere you go. So, yeah. What is, what is Kube TLS? At, at its most basic, it is, it is an admission controller. It's, it's a mutating webhook configuration object inside of your Kubernetes cluster. What, what that means is the Kubernetes cluster is going to, based on the filters that you set up in the, in the, in the YAML for this object, it's going to send every pod request to our, um, to our service. It makes a web call to our service. We return beta data back to the, the uh, Kubernetes master. We modify that incoming pod request, add the certificate secrets, add certificates to it that contain the secrets so that they're mounted on a file system visible to that pod. And so all that pod has to do is pick those certificates up from a, from a well-known location. Um, and so this is the building blocks of a uh, um, trust architecture. So yeah, it's got a uh, private key, a matching private key, and it's got essentially the trust bundle. So it's got the root certificates that you care about for this pod um, in there, which is basically just your internal CA in most cases. We'll talk about the different types of patterns that you'll use. Um, that bottom bullet will get replaced by the cap when it's doing cluster trust bundles when that feature is added to Kubernetes, and then all you need to do is provide a secret and a key. Um, and this is the building blocks of an architecture that we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've already mostly covered this, but your application should speak only TLS. Um, your, your organization itself is a zone of trust, um, right? There is no such as thing as, as zero trust, but you can make your application to application connections the start of a zone of trust and once you have done so, the, you adding the, the you know, identity aware part of allowing things to connect uh, becomes very simple, right? Once you have the, the core identity pro, uh, and encryption provided, uh, identity and authentication provided on every request, um, the rest of this you know, just falls into place. So this is an example of how not to do it, which is basically just the side card pattern we think is flawed because there's open text that is, as the previous presenter mentioned, like if somebody, somebody is a muck on your network, which, you know, I mean, you have to think of that as a valid possibility. Um, you have to assume breach, and so if you assume breach, that clear text connection can be sniffed and, and used in, in various nefarious yeah. ways. So this is why we don't like this architecture. We'd rather that that application pod speak TLS so that's yeah. encrypted well before it hits any of your network architecture inside the code, um, inside the running application, it's encrypted before it hits network. And, and just to network. be clear, this is hard to sniff. This is, not, this is not easy to happen. On the other hand, Istio fails open. Um, if your sidecars aren't injected, your application will still try to talk and the proxy won't be there and it'll just talk to the network. Um, that's a problem. That's, that is actually, Pretty much the crux of our argument. And, like and, Istio fails open, you don't want that. And there are ways to like bypass yeah. the the network. If I have a rogue app that's on that's been deployed to the cluster, I can ignore the fact that there's a sidecar there and talk 
Now, yeah. you can fix that with complex CNIs, but those are complex CNIs that, you know, yeah. now you, um, yeah. So this is our opinion. This is much easier to, uh, to implement in our opinion, although this looks as complicated as anything else. This is just a set of repeated patterns done the same way with slightly different regular pre-planned variations on what they are. So here's. Yeah. So this, this is what an app looks like, right? It has, it is serving something and it is acting as a client. Um, and it does so with you know, certificates provided by as, or certificates chaining up to your trust bundle. Um, it connects to, you know, it has an identity on your network, um, and that identity might tell it, might say, you know, I am the server for X. And that identity might say, I am the client that has this service account. Um, and you might just, you know, put both of those into the same client certificate um, as kubetls does. It just creates a client certificate um, a client slash server certificate for each pod when it comes up. Um, it figures out which services it should be valid for, so it adds the DNS names, the appropriate DNS names to it as DNS SANS. Um, and it adds the, the service account in uh, as both the common name and the spiffy um, sort of style ID. Um, and probably more as we you know, figure out and, and turn f add feature flags to, to make this work in interesting ways. Um, there's still some you know, question about how exactly those identities should be represented, though Spiffy seems to be a, a pretty clear, you know, pretty commonly used. Um, so this is another way to, to, to apply the same pattern. So this would be talking to partners on the web. So um, there are two different ways to do this. We prefer the way on the top because we think it's, it's, it's more long-term robust. But let's talk about that. So what you do is, um, in your internal service and their internal service, you trade trust bundles. And that way, when their API server uses its internally generated certificate to talk to your server, you're going to validate that certificate that you're going to do an MTLS, mutual TLS authentication of the incoming client cert with the trust bundle that, that's been in, injected into your pod. That trust bundle, in this case, is your partner's trust bundle. And therefore, you trust that certificate. <laughs> On, on the calling side there, your partner's API is going to make a call to a web server. And when that web server sends back the, hello, I am server XYZ, essentially, hello, I am blue server internal API, it checks that blue certificate to see if it's valid. And it does so against your trust bundle, which is the blue trust bundle. And so it says, yes, this certificate chain matches cryptographically. So we, we're good to go. We'll accept, you know, we'll, we believe we're talking to the correct you know, blue server, and that yellow certificate that we send down the line, the blue server is able to validate that yellow server as belonging to the yellow company. Um, the other way to do this is basically um, not to trade trust bundles, but to trade certificates. Um, that works just as well because the blue server will be validating a blue certificate against the blue um, trust bundle. That works. Uh, the problem with that is that you want to be able to rotate your certificates pretty fast, and that means exchanging certificates with your partners on a regular basis, say every 60 days, every, every month, every week, like whatever your uh, aggressive certificate rotation plan is. You're probably not going to get down to seconds with that. <laughs> probably not get seconds. But, the up but your certificates, your, your CAs aren't going to change all that often. Yeah. So that's something you can do yearly and then still rotate your certificates. You rotate your blue certificates as fast as you want they rotate their yellow certificates as fast as they want. You two pretty much don't care what you're doing operationally. Right. You, so that's you why just we care that you talk. trust each other. You care that you trust each other. Um, so here is the details on what a kube TLS certificate um, looks like. Um, so we we start by you know being called as a webhook. Um, we look up the container services. So um, one of the the flaws in our model is that. Whatever services the pod is associated with when it starts up are the host names that it gets. Uh, if you create the service after you create the pod, then you're out of luck. Um, if you change the pod afterwards, you change the labels on either the pod or the service afterwards and change the services it matches to, then you're out of luck, um, which is fine so long as you don't do that very often. Um, it's also fine if you move away from doing the DNS SANS and start moving to a model where Rather than authenticating the services, you authenticate the service accounts that you're trying to connect to. Um, 
And that's sort of the, the step that you want to go to eventually. Um, but for the moment, you know, DNS SANS is, is really easy and compatible with everything. Um, so kubetls then creates a, a CSR. Um, CSRs are an object, a top level cluster level object in Kubernetes. Um, and you can use them to do certificate signing and approval. Um, it will approve or uh, its controller to approve will approve. Um, and then it attaches, uh, it attaches a secret to your pod by way of mutating your pod um, and responds back to that with to, to Kubernetes with that. Um, yeah. So these are the, the, the key fields that we use in, in uh, the X509 certificate that we're creating and injecting into, into the pod. Um, so uh, the common name is the name of the pod. So common name used to be the website that it served for, but now that has moved to the SAN, the subject alternative name. So we've used SAN many times without defining it, but the SAN is the subject alternative name. And that's the list by which most of your HTTP mechanism will validate, like, am I talking to server X? If the, cer if the certificate that server X presented you contains the SAN that says server X, then yes, you're talking to them. And oh, by the way, the, the, it, it cryptographically chains up to the root, right? Um, that's what we do. So uh, the name of the pod and the subject alternative name, it's a DNS with the names of the service, the name of the pod, and any other DNS name that, that makes sense uh, based on the flags that you give kubetls. We also throw in a, a, a spiffy ID that's based on the service. Um, and so you can use this with, with your spiffy IDs. Um, we set the key usage, so in, in a X509 certificate, there's a field that says, how can you use this key? There are a couple of values there. One is, this is a root CA, this is a, this is a signing, typically an intermediate CA, or this is a web server, or this is a, a client certificate, and we set them both. You are a web server and a client certificate so that you can use the same certificate on either side, on we, the, the client side or the, the web we server We do the side. same thing that Let's Encrypt does. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what's important. Um, and then it also you know, has the identity of the root it's signing up to. Yeah. Um, so let's do a demo. Demos are fun. Yes. Uh, Apologies to Semisonic here yeah. for, the, for the lyrics. Um, let's mirror this, and let's make this a little bit bigger. Is that big enough? Can people read that? It mm -hmm. probably helps if I move it up so you can actually see what's going on. Um, so I already have some of the pods running, but I am going to delete it so that we can see a fresh one. So uh, what we've got is a, a greeter service and a greeter client that will demo. Yeah. Um, and the, the greeter. It's, um, it's the hello world example. It's the gRPC hello world example, but modified to use TLS nicely as we want it to. Um, so here is our pod. And we can exec into it. Um, and look at its uh, look at the certificate that has been generated. Helps if I get my flags quite right. Cool. So here is a certificate. Um, you can see its issuer is our issuer, uh, and that will match up with the CA certificate that it's also provided in that file system. Um, you can see that the DNS names, it's got its uh, the service name, it's got the pod name, and then it's got a spiffy UID. Um, and it's just a standard TLS uh, client server cert. Um, RSA, at the moment, I was putzing around with adding uh, ECDSA, but you know, close enough. Um, and this more or less works. Um, and you can see the CSR that was generated a few seconds ago when I deleted this pod. Um, you know, Kube, Kube TLS went through the process of creating this CSR, ish, uh, approving it, um, a signer that we've set up for this, 
um, which you know you can use cert manager, you can use an external signer, um, or you can use a very basic one that is here for this demo. Um, all of those work. It, it's agnostic to the actual signer, um, which you know allows you to provide your own or or do something better. Um, and then we can just you know create uh, call a service. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the greeter server is a greeter client that's just a batch job that runs and exits, and so the pod runs and, and, and then shuts down. Yep. And because the job, Kubernetes doesn't restart it, but saves the logs, and so we can examine the logs after it's run. Yeah. And so you know this just connects. Um, it connects to the, the appropriate name. Um, it gets the greeting, and it also sees uh, the service account that we've been running as. So if I were to modify my greeter client, um, I can set the service account name. That has chosen a very weird indentation. Here we go. Oh. Can you stop for one second? Yeah. So scroll down a little bit. We've mm -hmm. got some stuff coming out. But when you look at the, um, um, Okay. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what you're pointing at. Yeah, no, I was. Um, so we can create a, another version of it with a different service account, running as a different service account. And now it has this other identity visible to it, again, through the, the Kube TLS uh, certificate. And that, this through other identity is not, it's not our client saying that. That is the server that it is connected to that has said, you know, here I know who you are. I can verify who you are. Um, so what else is there that is interesting? Um, the other thing that's sort of interesting is that, you know, it's MTLS, right? If I override the CA and I use some other random self-signed MTLS cert, oh, geez, how did I screw this up? There's a mix of tabs and spaces, and now I am realizing it. Let's fix this. Uh, oh, yeah. Both of those are the same. Cool. I don't know why you have a caps lock key. You create yet another copy of this, and this one will fail because it is using a self-signed certificate. Um, this one is actually failing on the um, client side because it's signed by an unknown authority, but we can have it fail on the, uh, on the other side when we present it an unexpected key. Um, and if we go look at the logs of our, oh, well, okay, the debug logs are not working. It should have printed out that we got a failed connection from this other server. That we denied a connection. Yeah. That actually, they, so the first, the first failure was when we saw the other side certificate, like when it sent us our certificate, when it sent its server hello certificate, I am server XYZ, along with that certificate, we looked at it and said, that doesn't chain to our certificate authority, so we're closing the connection from the client side. Yeah. The second error was we accepted that certificate because it did chain up, and then we sent it an invalid certificate that didn't chain up to its cluster tr trust bundle, and so the server closed the cert certificate on that side. It says use of closed network connection, which means we tried to write because we thought this was going to work, but the server closed down on us because it didn't trust our certificate. Yep. Um, cool. I think that's all we have. Uh, a couple of wrap-up slides. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's move back here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, 
this makes it really easy to you know, have certificates populated and have certificates populated in your application's namespace so your application can make use of certificates rather than trying to wrap it in some network layer that does this all magically. Um, you know, there, there are advantages to both kinds of magic. We like ours. Yeah. Um, we think all your developers should learn how to use TLS and mutual TLS. Like, we think that's, that should be the price of entry for being a programmer on, the, on cloud native. But also that we should make it simple enough that they can know. Again, you know, your, your MTLS demo is 95% playing with certificates. We've collapsed that down to certificates are provided for you. Just do the right code. Yeah. Um, and you know, there, there is some agnosticism to identity policy. policy. Um, we intend to provide a reasonable set of defaults that you can flip on and off. Um, and hopefully one day it will you know, be one, just one, but at the moment there's still some, some question. Um, once everybody's establishing authentication through uh, MTLS, then the authorization layer becomes you know, relatively easy. You can see who you're talking to so then you can pick what their actual authorization level is. Uh, and I think there's... So other future directions. Um, private keys should be generated on the nodes and never leave the nodes. Currently they're created through secrets. Um, that's suboptimal. If they were generated on the nodes, then, this, then the private key material would never leave the nodes. Um, that would be great. Um, so we're planning on moving to a CSI model. There is not ready for demo, but there's some work on that. Um, so that the, so that rather than mounting a secret, you mount a kube TLS CSI that just generates the C, generates uh, for you the private key material when when the node comes up, and the rest of it happens uh, pretty much the same way. Yeah. But um, it happens on the node rather than at a central set of pods yeah. on your cluster. So, because it happens on the, on, you know, those, that logic is on every node and the private keys stay on every node, yeah. um, never getting transmitted, even though it's being transmitted by the, by the Kubernetes control plane in TLS, we'd rather just not transport those, those around. Yeah. Um, and this should be built into Kubernetes. Um, but, you know, that's our opinion. We like it. Yeah. The trust plus, the cluster trust bundles is one step in that direction. We hope it's a it's huge changed. step. Well. Yeah. We, we hope that we'll knock down those dominoes and move forward. Yeah. Cool. Plan for world domination. <laughs> um, yeah. Here is our repo. Here is our presentation slides. And here is the session feedback link. So, sorry Thank to keep much. you from the uh, vendor booth crawl. So yeah. there should be beer available now. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. But thank you. We're, we're here for questions. Uh, yes, though in a branch. Yeah. I, I, I will be glad to help you run that demo on your cluster if you would like to. If you look at the git commit, it was like, I don't know, about an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, Go we ahead. Yeah. Um, yes, but we're not confident enough in the code quality yet to do that, um, mostly because I wanted to make the demo work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Question oh. in the back? Um, so we work with any CA that provides a Kubernetes signer. Um, so the, that is a very short list at the moment. That's Cert Manager. Um, but at the same time, there is also a, not even in the branch, but a, a super, super janky demo of here is how you use a AWS CA to provide a Kubernetes signer uh, that I, you know, spent 20 minutes on last weekend. So let's let's talk about it. I'm I'm glad to to do the work to make that work, and I do intend to do the work to make My, that work. Microsoft has CA like parts of their Azure CA are exposed in their in their AKS stuff, right? Oh, okay, then so, then then, I'll, then it will just work. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it should just work, but if that we is already tried it. if that is already exposed, then yeah, it should just work. Um, right. So I've I've tried it with you know our own CA and I've tried it with 
uh, cert manager, and I see no reason why it wouldn't work with the other CA that I've used, which is the HashiCorp Vault signer um, for CSRs. And that, like anything that is a Kubernetes CSR signer, will work, you know, unless there's something really weird about it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Excellent question. Thank you. Yeah. You get an extra beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering about the distributed trust bundle. Um, yeah. Are there library limitations or concerns that will make, for example, updating the federal trust group for an open SSL application not work so well? Um, yes and no. I mean, the, the simple answer is that a trust bundle is all equivalent um, in most SSL implementations. And that means that you want to be careful about what you put in, a, in your CA list. Um, there are additional, like, I, I, I do believe that you are getting at, at a leading question about how open SSL handles CA PEMs, which I... Yeah. And then you add new certs. Oh, yes, so of course. Yeah, and that, that, that answer is no. That answer is very clearly no. <laughs> um, and if you start your application and then, we, and then you want to rotate certificates, the answer is still no. Um, your application, unlike with some other things, like it doesn't pick up new certificates on a regular basis. We don't provide a, a rotation mechanism of these secrets. Um, what should you do about that? Kill your pod, restart. Kill your, kill your pod. Kill your like, pod every it, 30 days. Yeah. 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 Um, what about running SSL Do you uh, do that? Do you no. Yeah. Uh, no. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, yes, but at the same time, like, we're, we're going for the, the least common denominator here of we don't expect, yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't, we are absolutely limit, limited by all of the limitations of your OpenSSL library, whether that be OpenSSL, LibreSSL, Golang's a Go SSL implementation, whatever bouncy you're castle, using. Whatever. Yeah, please not Bouncy Castle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, we got the one minute. I think we, we yeah. we're good. Yeah. So, time to turn off the mics.